Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Director, Analyst, Gartner Research and Advisory, and your Conference Chair, Ed Gabriz. Welcome back. It's my pleasure to introduce you to you, Andreas Ekstrom. Andreas is an author, a columnist, and a thought leader on the digital revolution. He passionately promotes and educates for digital equality, and his aim is to see a world which we share the wealth not only financially, but also in terms of knowledge, and power, and influence. Andreas is a popular lecturer, and he is here today to talk to you about seven ways to own the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Andreas Ekstrom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible venue. What a great place for me to visit today. Not only the cultural and aesthetical capital of Europe, but also an important hub for Gartner and friends. I know that. My name is, as I said, Andreas Ekström. I am a reporter turned speaker, and I try to understand the digital world at the best of my knowledge and ability. That's really what I'm doing. A couple of things, though, that I'm not. You've met futurists that have been jumping up on stages like this, and they tell you, I have Googled the future. It's over there and to the right. And if you just follow my lead, everything is now going to be swell. That's not what I'm doing at all. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing instead, rather than giving those perfect answers just in a second. Uh, there are a few things that I like to uh, point out before we get going. Another one would be some of you who may have been Googling me have learned that I wrote a book about Google a few years back called The Google Code. That sounds awfully technical. You may think that this is going to be a very technical talk and that I am a very technical guy. I'm painfully aware that I kind of look like a technical guy. You know, whenever I walk into a room, people assume I'm there to change the, the toner in the printer. I have no idea why they think that's my field of, of expertise, but it's a common misconception and I take every chance I can to kind of move that out of the way. Because I am into this because the sociology of tech, the culture of tech, and the politics of tech. If you want to ask advice for servers or cables, don't talk to me about that. But let's see if we can understand the ongoing revolution and change of society together for the next 45 minutes. So this is not a SWOT analysis either, by the way. It's not about the winners or the losers or the threats, nor the opportunities. It is, however, a little bit about the power and the responsibility. The power and the responsibility. Those are key terms for any reporter, right? You look to whoever is holding power, and then you hold them accountable. Very simple, and that's why, where, where it started for me as a newspaper reporter. How come we've moved so much power to a few power players in the technical field without asking the right questions to them? That's where it all started. So the questions is sort of always my methodology, and that's what we're going to see for the next 45 minutes as well. I was saying that I'm not here to give you perfect answers. And you know why? Because I assume that you know yourself what you're doing when you go to the office in the morning. Woo! <laughs> I didn't hear a roaring yes for that one, but you know, I'm going to trust that you are experts in your own field. I'm going to. Trust that you know what you're doing when you're going to the office in the morning, because otherwise you wouldn't be going to a place like this. You need to be interested at a certain level to be going to a place like this, to this incredible conference. You already know your competition. You already know what you're good at. You're painfully aware of what you're not so good at. You know where you need to improve. Take all of that stuff that you already know. Look at it through the glasses I'm providing for you this short time that we have together and look not for perfect answers for the future, ladies and gentlemen, but for the best questions. If you can leave the symposium here today with a couple of new, open, honestly curious questions about our digital future, I'm all set. You can ask them to me, get in touch online, you can ask them to each other, to your management, to your colleagues, or even your competition. But that's the way we should be figuring the future out. Let's not set our minds to finding a strategy that's going to last us for three months or six months or nine months or 12 months. 
The only thing we're going to accomplish if we do that is we're going to be wrong. You know, hopefully in an interesting way, but we're only going to be wrong. So let's stick to the questions and see where that may take us. Okay, Seven Ways to Own the World is the name of this presentation. It's my take on our digital future for the next decade. Ten major issues for ten years is where I started this. And I started to narrow it down and I started to figure out, try to see some of these are big, some are small, some are connected, and I ended up with the seven ways. Seven issues that I think are going to be dominating the digital debate for the decade to come. Some threats. Some opportunities, indeed, in that. You'll understand how this is planned out as we go along. We'll start with number one right away. The first way to own the world is to own our identity. To own our identity. So, so what is this then? Well, let's go to Greece. Let's say that we have a government meeting in Athens, Greece today, and the Greek government has decided that they need to improve on EID. On, on digital identity for its citizens. They're not happy with the solutions that they are trying. We need to try to implement something. Otherwise, we can't be running a government in an efficient way. This is something we have to figure out. This goes for a lot of governments in the world. So the minister in charge says, can I please have some money out of next year's budget to build a really good EID solution? Yeah, that's going to be hard because Greece has gone through some, some tough times financially. It's going to be hard to make that, those kinds of investments at this point. So they say, no, we're going to have to wait, and we can't do that. But then, big surprise, the door opens, and in walks Mark Zuckerberg. Straight from Facebook. And he says, oh, oh, okay, you guys are talking about EID, digital identity. That's interesting. We've been talking a lot about that at Facebook. We've been thinking a lot about it at Facebook. And I have this idea for you. How about that we, on Monday, roll out an EID solution for all of the nation of Greece, where you can actually connect the Facebook account to all of what you need to run the government efficiently. Healthcare, you know, vote in local elections, get in touch with your local government, the tax authorities, all of what you need, nicely connected to the Facebook account. Are you interested in such an EID solution? And the Greek government says, well, yes, we are. That's exactly what we need to run our government in an efficient way. But we just concluded we don't have the money right now, so we can't be doing that. No, 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 Mark says. You're, you're getting me wrong here. It's on the house. <laughs> I'm paying. One condition, though. You have to write a law that requires all Greek citizens to register on Facebook. Because otherwise, this is not going to be interesting for me. I have to try to, to test this at a nation level. Otherwise, it's not going to be an interesting, big enough beta test for me. <laughs> All right. What does the Greek government do in a situation like this, or any government in a situation like this? Greece is just an example. There are plenty of other possible examples. Right? What will they do? I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what they should do, but I know that there are a lot of cocky people around Europe that can say, oh, we would never do that. We would never take all of our citizens' data and put it into an American database over which we have no control. Yeah, that's easy for some people to say. And you know why? Because they have the money to say no. This is my only one-liner, and that's why it's got its own slide. Check this one out. Integrity is a luxury for those who can afford it, ladies and gentlemen. And this goes for humanity all together. It's not, not just government. It goes for us. You don't see me leading seminars for uh, international mafia groups. And that's because I don't like organized crime. I have three children, though. If they were starving, I'd be holding week-long seminars for organized crime in Europe. I promise you. Because <laughs> that's what mankind is like. German author Bertolt Brecht, he said it best. First comes the food, and then comes the ethic. Right? It, I mean, it's nothing strange. That's the way we are. If you can afford to have a high ethical standard, that's really great. But if you can't, you're not going to be bothered. Integrity is a luxury for those who can afford it. So it's a really hard decision. And it's hard to say, yeah, we wouldn't do that if you have the money. And I'm going to give you a... a Actually, I'm going to go into a couple of Swedish examples today. I am from Sweden, and I'd like to just bring some of that international fare to, to this international crowd. So I'm going to stick to some of my Swedish examples. And let's do that through discussing your smartphone that you all have in this room. 
100% of you, considering who you are, have a smartphone. By the way, that is such a terrible, terrible expression. Smartphone, that I'm going to need myself some bigger quotation marks because it's just such a dumb expression. There's nothing particularly smart about your phone. It's a lovely handheld connected device. It rocks, it's changed the world, but it doesn't exactly contain a super sophisticated artif artificial intelligence at this point. Some, but not you know, at that level. Smartphone is clever sales talk for us to love the darn thing more. Let's just make that clear. And also, forgive me for saying this, but there is no cloud, ladies and gentlemen. There is just other people's computers. <laughs> you know, we just, we just have to keep on our eye on the language sometimes. Because language can be really powerful when you want to sell something. But as a, on, the, on the consumer side of things, you're just going to have to watch what we're calling things. OK, on your smartphone, now, there's plenty of different nationalities in the room. I'm sure there are some Swedes. Any Swedes? Any friend, fellow countrymen? Quite a bit. Welcome. What's here to see it here? All your Swedes, all of you, 100% of you, I challenge you with this. The Swedes are going to come to me afterwards if I'm wrong. They're going to have the same app for digital identification of themselves on their phone. And I'm going to show you th that app. It looks like this Bank ID. Bank ID is, is an app that almost all Swedish people have on their cell phones. There are different solutions in different countries. Bank ID is really just seven big banks getting together to make a good login solution for our bank business. Great. Nothing strange about that. But some brainiac concluded something really smart when they were doing this. They said, how about we make this open enough that we can make an offer to all of public Sweden, all of the nation of Sweden, and say, you want to tag along here? Do you want to use the bank ID system to, for people to log on to their health care and their government authorities and their tax authorities and whatnot? You, you, would you want to be in on that? And the government of Sweden said, oh, yes, great, that's wonderful, thank you. Then we don't have to worry about building our own system. Let's just do that as well. And they did. And think about it for two seconds. What did we just do there in Sweden? Did we just privatize the issuing of identity for all of our citizens? I guess we did, with no debate at all. I'm not super pro-government or anything. It's not that. It's just that I'm comfortable with having the issuing of identity and ID, something that the government takes care of. When my passport expires, I'll gladly go to the police to renew it. I don't want them to be sending me over to the travel agent to get a new passport, because they have that franchise that year. I just don't want to do that. Yeah, my driver's license is expiring. Yeah, talk to Volkswagen. They're taking care of that for you. This, this. No, thanks. That's just not the society I want. Some things we need to do and own publicly. And you know what I think we should be doing in Sweden and all over Europe and all over the world? We should say no to this wonderful, incredibly great, high-service, smooth solution that everybody loves. And we should build a more expensive one that's going to be uglier and have more downtime that everybody's going to hate. That's what we should be doing. And I'm, t I'm serious. That's what we should be doing. And why? Because if I may be a little um, pretentious here for a second, all of us in this room, we are the first digital generation. We are the first internet generation. The principles that we lay down may very well be standing for 100 years or more. We're writing a digital constitution. We better get it right. And outsourcing just whatever because we feel comfortable doing that right now or that we don't have the stamina or the money to do it right right now, it's not a good way to write a constitution. That's more the path of least resistance. So we need to have the courage to sometimes say, yeah, we need to develop this fast, but we need to do it right. That's why I think, seriously, that we should be doing that. Let people use their bank ID to log on to their banks, but nothing else. However, if you look at this at a global perspective, we're having a planet now with 7.8 billion people, give or take. All of us have internet access, right? No, 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 no. About 3 billion people have yet to experience the internet. Just 
just think about that one for a second. I mean, that kind of feels surreal while in Europe we have more connected devices than people since many years we do. But around the world, three billion people have yet to come online. And everybody who's an expert of this will say, well, give it 10 or 15 years and we're going to have a 95% plus connectivity in the world. That means three billion potential customers for the biggest and best equipped digital companies. But it also means huge challenges for nation states, for governments, to make an efficient operation of all of what is public. Now, if you can help build that, if you can build the hardware, if you can build the software, if you can help with the legal work, if you can find a language, a way somehow to facilitate that we all become trustworthy digital citizens, a solution that will work for all of this. Oh, you are so going to own the world. And one last question before we leave this first segment. Is there any particular company right now who's particularly well equipped and well positioned to take that position at all? Yeah. Yeah, there is. All right, let's move on. Second way to own the world. The second way to own the world is to own our time. We're going to talk about culture consumption here a little bit. What do we actually do online? We live in an attention economy, right? I mean, the eyeballs, the time and the eyeballs. That's what we need to make the money and to get out with our, the political messages that we have. So, internet behavior stats, back in the year 2001, the, the 10 largest websites on the internet accounted for 30% of all web traffic. Bit of a blockbuster internet way back then. Very few websites that accounted for a lot. It continued, actually, to be even worse in 2010. 10 big websites, 75% now of all web traffic. This is kind of far away from the pluralistic internet that I fell in love with back in 1991, the web. The promise of a decentralized, uncontrolled internet with small, weird niches for all kinds of stuff. That particular manufacturer for that particular thing over there. That political special interest over there. That cultural interest over there. Very democratic, lots of small, prosperous companies rather than a few giants to own us all. It was kind of an exciting time when you thought that that was going to be the internet. However, it turned out to not really be the internet. We have a lot of middlemen now. And the middlemen are becoming so incredibly important for us to find the niches of, of the web. However, there are niches on the web. There's plenty of great niches on the web. I've picked some out for you. I like this one. Has feminism gone too far.com? <laughs> no. <laughs> now, it, it's not my website. It, it, it's, it's somebody else. But I, I'm just pretty sure that these guys are going to change it to a yes if it does, because that's the only thing that they do, you know? This, this is 90s internet for me. The weird, funny, just somehow quirky little niche. The promise of diversity on the internet. I've got a couple of more. Here's eelslap.com. I mean, you all, sometimes you just want to know what it looks like when a guy gets slapped in the face in slow motion by an eel. So you go to eelslap.com. They rule at that. that. They're the number one eel slapper on the internet. <laughs> and of course, I have this little, I think I have this little hip hop tribute here at hey.com, at links to ho.com. Isn't that great? I mean, that's somebody who really made an effort in making internet silly. And I love that. I love that because we have to remember that there's a, that whole stupidity holds a larger promise of a democratized internet with prosperous small businesses where people can actually get involved in building society that's going to be good for all. But these niches are now only found one way, through Facebook or through Google. Google with its market share of 89%, and Facebook with its user growth last year of 17%. With 1 billion people logged on to Facebook every day for 52 minutes per person, looking at 100 million hours of video and uploading 300 million images per day. All of that is insane and almost impossible to fathom, right? But the growth is incredible, and, and the dominance for these few companies is, is becoming somewhat problematic. Let me just show you how this can play out. This figure here, 300, 300 million still images per day, is actually something that Facebook is not particularly proud of. They don't think that's enough. And they started to see this already back in 2011, 2012. What was the problem? How come the kids didn't upload more pictures on Facebook? It kind of started to flat out a little bit. What was the explanation? Ah, they discovered Instagram. That nice new photo app where people post selfies of questionable quality. 
back in the old days, when somebody did something better than you, you rolled up your sleeves and you got to work and you started competing. And that competition process led to a better end, pro end product for the end user. You would compete through price or quality or in any other way. It would almost always work like that. But not in a time where we're seeing that few players hold almost all of the cash. So what did Facebook do? Did they compete? Did they improve? No. They just bought these guys. Was it expensive? No. Because <laughs> this is a day and a half profit for them. So it wasn't expensive. It was a steal of a generation for Facebook to buy Instagram for, for a billion bucks because they have the kind of money that it doesn't really matter. History repeated itself with WhatsApp. You would think that WhatsApp would have made for a better messenger. Well, of course not. Facebook just bought it instead. Was it expensive? Yeah. You can argue it was expensive this time. And if we're looking for big questions today, by the way, if we're old enough to have met companies who are worth $19 billion before, 200 times the value of Volvo when it was sold, we've learned that it's good when a really, really big company becomes really prosperous because that will provide for a lot of jobs for people, and in that way we'll share the wealth and we have a healthy economy for everybody. Yeah, not so much. There were about 50 people working at WhatsApp when they were valued at this level. So that means if we can agree on globally that we're still going to have a military defense, some roads, um, some health care, some education, and we want to pay for most of that through the tax bill, which, which is the most common th way to do it still in the world. We obviously can't do that by taxing people who go to work. Not if only 50 people have a job. So we're going to need global tax reform then, I guess. Otherwise, we're going to see 1% of the world's population owning almost everything and the rest be unemployed, that's going to lead to a violent revolution. So we're going to have to completely rethink the way we're paying taxes and the way that we're financing for whatever stuff we want to get public. That's only two thought steps away from one particular acquisition. Can't give you an answer on where we're going, but just to point out, if we're looking for a big question, there's one. What can we learn from such an acquisition? All right, spending our time on the internet, what do we like to do? We like to hang out on the social networks. We like to talk to each other over Facebook, over WhatsApp. We like to interact over images on Instagram. Three companies, incredibly interesting and prosperous, conveniently owned by one man who owns so much of these companies. At this point, he can't even be fired by his own board of directors. Yeah, he's going to be 35 soon. All right, third way to own the world. This is one of my favorites. The third way to own the world for the next decade, and any decade, is going to be to make money on money, of course. Ask Visa, ask MasterCard. If you can put yourself in the middle of a transaction and just take a little money on each transaction, there's plenty of money to be made at all times, right? So banks and the financial systems of the world have been particularly good at maintaining their position in the digital revolution and all the disruption that's going on. Almost every other business has taken a big hit and, and involuntarily had to reinvent themselves. But banks have been pretty good. We're going we're gonna to try to explain why. If we go back to uh, 1990s internet and just, just remember what it looked like? Yeah, some of you are old enough. Netscape 1.8. We would start our day by searching something on Alta Vista and finding nothing at all. <laughs> That's what it was like. So we would go to the big portals, like this one. This is the number one portal in Sweden in 1997. The Postal Service started it. That was quite, a, quite inventive of them. They realized we're, not, we're deliverers of information, envelopes. We're not going to be doing that so much in the future. We have to develop something else. What we do, OK, we take 10 of the smartest people we have at the Postal Service, we put them in an office off-site and say, be gone for a year. Invent whatever the heck you want online and come back and show me the thing that's going to be disrupting us so that we own it. See, that's the only reasonable way to work with research and development. Take your 10 smartest people, put them in an office on town, tell them to be back in one year inventing the thing that will ruin you. Otherwise, somebody else is going to do it. But you have to have the courage to see that that's the way you need to move. Swedish Postal Service did it partly because when they were number one on the internet, they closed this down. Some jack said that, that yeah, this is not what we're doing. We're developing envelopes. That's what we're doing. So yeah, good luck with that. 
So internet development went on to social networks, also Swedish one, Lunar Storm was the predecessor of both MySpace and Facebook, the one, the first that kind of preluded what was going to be happening. And of course, the first financial game changer, Napster, the illegal file sharing service that everybody has heard of, but nobody has used. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, this, this is such an interesting example. You all know what happened. This was illegal, and, and the record industry fought it and almost killed themselves over fighting it. Instead of saying, oh, the internet is coming. Let's take 10 smart people, put them in a different office, and have them invent the new distribution model. That's what they should have done. They didn't. They took it to court and almost died. Now, they did have a good chance to learn, though, because the way kids are around culture, they're not super occupied with patents and copyright and stuff, right? I, I know a lot about this myself. I was quite the pirate when I was 11. Recognize a Commodore 64? <laughs> this is my computer. This is, this is the one. And this is in my basement. This picture is, however, quite recent. These are my daughters. Say hello to Judith and Sigrid. They're playing international karate. You get a 1,000 bonus points if you kick your opponent in the head. Parent of the month for teaching them that. <laughs> um, however, if you're really uh, into hardware, you might recognize, if you, if you look really hard down in the corner here, a disk drive, a 1541, and a whole lovely box full of floppy disks, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, on which you can remove the copy protection with a pair of scissors, <laughs> if you know where to cut. And I knew where to cut. There's not a single game in that box that I paid for. It's all pirated. So this is inevitably the behavior of, of kids going into the culture war. It, maybe it's changing, but, but that was, they could have learned. They had a good chance to learn. But the only people who have learned from this, who have learned the idea of disruption, the idea of a new behavior and actually taking it somewhere, is the bank and the financial systems. Um, I think it's partially because we are so conservative. We don't like to put our money in some startup that we don't know. We'd rather have it with an old bank. So they've had some time and they've had some money and some, and some faith in developing that. So we see some of the new most interesting financial services actually being developed, not by startups, but by banks. Again, I'd like to show you a Swedish example. There's plenty of others, but I'd like to show you the Swedish one. You know, I'm Swedish. Here's a payment app called Swish. Again, all of the Swedish friends in the room have it. Any Swedes in the room who do not have Swish, say yes now. Of course. Of course you have it. Of course you have it. We all do. It's a very simple little app that allows me to just text you money, basically. Four colleagues go out to lunch, I put it on my credit card, yours was 12 euros, yours was 14 euros, boom, boom, you send the money and it's done. It's just a transfer from my bank account to yours. That's all it is, but it's connected to the phone number rather than the bank account number, brilliant. And also, the banks own this and they pretend that they sort of don't. Nowhere on this app can you tell who owns it and runs it. It's the four largest banks of Sweden who do it. But they realize that their old, heavy brand is never going to be attractive when it comes to being a snazzy, smart startup. So let's just put some googly colors on it and call it Swish and spell it with a small s and we're going to be all youthful, right? It's brilliant. They got it right. They invented the disruption and they called it something else and they checked their egos at the door and now they own that. Good. And that's just one out of many solutions that we need to see coming. Um, you know, there's PayPal, they're doing their thing. There's Bitcoin. Yeah, there's Bitcoin. <laughs> the solution to a problem that almost nobody has. <laughs> and as much as I love to make fun of Bitcoin, I just want to say one thing, though, that's kind of interesting about it. Maybe the cryptocurrency is not what we should be thinking about here. Maybe it's the blockchain. Maybe it's the new technology of the diversified coding that we should be looking at and understand better. Because you know what? Looking back in history, hardly any innovations have actually come to place by the first use of a new technology. So many examples of that. You remember Google's glasses, right? The Google Glass? You you'd say hello to somebody and they start to look funny because they were reading a text message as they were shaking your hand. <laughs> And then they started filming you and it started re blinking red and you were like, back off, man. Um, <laughs> nobody wanted those. 
And, but that wasn't because the technology was bad. It was because nobody wanted to look like Terminator in social life. So it was a social reason. There was a social reason as to why we didn't want that technology. It was nothing wrong with the technology. It was just the first attempt of a product connected to the technology that was wrong. That's different, right? So let's laugh a little bit at this. I mean, it may go through the roof next week. What do I know? But the technology behind it, I would just advise humbly everybody to watch that space. Follow that. Read up on it. I'm thinking that there could be interesting things to come there. I just haven't quite seen that yet, but I'm thinking that it could be the case. So, moving on through the finance world, you know what we don't have? What's the one thing we're missing? I'm telling you what we're missing. We yet do not have a single player who's had the courage and the guts to step up to the middle of the stage and say, you know what, from now on, it's just going to be us. From now on, it's just going to be here. Here is where you have your monthly salary come in. Here's where you microfinance your mortgage on your house with your friends to almost no interest. This is the only currency you need, because with one click, you can buy everything that's available for sale online. From now on, this is the central bank. Nobody's tried to do that yet. I'm thinking it's going to be a political fight worth watching because if you take that tool away from governments, it's going to be very hard to govern nations. But if you're able to do that, if you're able to build that system, help with that system, have a part in that system, oh, you're so owning the world. And I will ask you again, is there any particular company that's particularly well equipped to take that position? Yes, but I don't think they're going to be doing it anytime soon because we're so politically aware right now that, that the, Facebook, the power concentration with Facebook is somewhat problematic. We would like to see a more pluralistic internet. They're, I'm sure they're working hard on finding solutions like that, but I don't think that they're going to be taking the lead just for tactical reasons. However, watch the finance space and be a part of it. Help build it. There's going to be so much work to be done in just a decade, and it's going to be profitable almost however you do it. Fourth way to own the world, we're moving into journalism. To get to decide what we get to see. To decide what we get to see is going to be a great way to own the world. I mean, that's what an editor always did, right? Making the front page of a newspaper, deciding what we get to see there. However, the editor of a newspaper was always a couple of people deciding on one particular newspaper in one particular region. Now that editor is the guy writing the algorithm for your Facebook feed instead. So this is what we're doing right now in journalism. We're trying to see if we can replace human judgment with an algorithm. Hard. Can it be done? Well, there are problems with it. I'm sure you've heard of the filter bubble, right? That's the whole concept that Eli Pariser, author, established in, in back in 2011. You look in your Facebook feed, you see a story, Donald Trump is a nut job. Oh, I like that. I click that. Okay. And then Facebook learns that you like that. So you go back to your Facebook feed and you see that again and you click and you like and all of a sudden you're in a bubble, like sort of a self-feeding system that tells you all of the stuff you already know. And then you're shocked that he can win an election because you didn't see a single article saying that he's not insane. That's the concept of the filter bubble, right? And that can happen. So now, why is this though different from the old editor of the 9 o'clock news, or the New York Times, or the Guardian, or La Vanguardia, or whatever. I'm thinking it's two things. It's the scalability and the virality. That makes for such a large difference in size that it's not even worth comparing. It's so important, let's do this in purple. Scalability, virality. It's just so large that any analog comparison just won't stand. It won't be really important to, to, to stay with it. It's just so different. Um, let me give you an interesting example. And this is somewhat disturbing. Uh, Norwegian newspaper Verdens Gang last year published a wonderful special on the Vietnam War, uh, an expose of pictures and, and texts and, and everything about the Vietnam War. They also published on their Facebook page some snippets of that which meant that they also published a very controversial and terrible picture that I'm sure that all of you have already seen. This is a picture of a little girl who's tore off her clothes, her burning clothes, to escape a napalm attack. Horrible image, uh, but an important image. Historically, incredibly important to understand the war. It changed the perception of the war in the Western world. So, Verdens Gang, the newspaper, said, you know what, this woman She's now a woman, she's alive. She's numerous times said that she'd be happy to never have to see this picture again. It's a traumatic memory for her. But yet, newspapers keep showing it. And that's because 
the news value or the historical value of the image is larger than her personal integrity. And when I put it like that, you realize how hard of a decision this is to make, but that's what the newspaper editor should be doing. However, Facebook's algorithm doesn't work like that. You know what it does? It says, oh, naked person, we don't do that. Boom, gone, takes the Facebook page away, no questions asked. Unable to see the context, unable to measure the historical value towards a person's integrity. You can identify we got a naked person, we're taking that away. That, of course, has happened to numerous statues, too. <laughs> Any Danes in the room? Did the, you have your most favorite, favorite sculpture in the harbor of Copenhagen, the Little Mermaid? Yeah, she didn't wear a bikini. Uh, the sculptor should have thought of that back in 1887 when he made her. But, of course, it's been taken off the internet, I don't know how many times, just for that same reason. The algorithm says, oh, nude person, we don't do that. Completely unable. So we're talking about interesting development in AI and machine learning. Yeah, interesting development for sure, but we have a long way to go, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, believe the hype, but be critical of it at the same time. This is so hard. This is so incredibly hard for an experienced human being. I, I, I just want to see the code. I just want to see some of the code that can figure this out before I believe that we actually end up getting it right. So um, this all, of course, is about the, the control of, of what we get to see. I incredibly important always. Can a machine do it? Maybe. Uh, is it a problem if a, machi a machine does it? No, if it does it, okay. But it has to be held accountable, and that's why we're gonna be, need, be needing humans in all sort of technical development for now and forever. The powerful person is the person writing the algorithm. No code is, per definition, neutral. And that's the key takeaway from that segment. Code can't be neutral. Code is political. Okay, fifth way to own the world is to be the link between people. That's always going to be a good idea, right? To provide the connective tissue for human beings, because we love to be in touch. Of course. It's always been good to own a phone network or to, to own um, lots of mailboxes and employ mailmen. Just provide a means of communication for people. Always been a really, really good thing. So um, what are we looking at as, as human beings? We're looking for one way. We're looking for a contact constant. Just something we can trust to get in touch with the people that we care about and other people too. You know, the phone book. Just some, some sort of trustworthy way where we can actually find the people that we want to find. Uh, but look at this girl, what happens in her life. She's 20, she's moving out, she's got a new postal address, new phone number, new job. She eventually will get married, get a new last name, a new email address, and nobody will take notice of any of that or write it down in a little address book or anything like that. Because why? Because we trust that we always can find her there. See, this is the true power of Facebook. How Facebook is becoming the phone book of the world, the contact constant where we trust that we can find everybody. I mean, think of this, the scrolling list that you have on your phone. You don't know any phone numbers anymore. You don't know the phone number to your wife or your husband, nor your kids. That's very irresponsible of you. You really should memorize them. <laughs> because you have this. So you trust that this is the contact constant. You trust this to be the way to find everybody you need to find. Now, think of a scrolling list like that with all the names you've got, but a list of everybody in the world and you're seeing what this is about to become. White pages with 7.8 billion people in it, a contact constant, the connective tissue that we can't stay out of. So why is this working so incredibly well? Well, I asked Clay Shirky, smartest guy I ever met, internet researcher in New York, and he said, well, whenever something catches on digitally to really change the world, it's usually because it solves an organizational problem so the digital revolution is just really getting organized just get easier. And I was like, okay, Clay, that sounds really smart, but you have to walk me through this. What do you mean? Is it really that simple? Yeah, because it's disrupting everything, right? We have cars, we have drivers, we have people who want to be passengers. Let's build Uber and getting organized just get easier for transportation. Yeah, makes sense. Or, uh, or um, how about, um, want to start a family? You want to fall in love, seriously? You want to go to the bar, order a beer, and cross your fingers? It's not an efficient method, but there's an app for that. Getting organized just get easier, right? Falling in love is an organizational problem. It is. 
Somebody is changing the world here, culturally and, and also in an in in incredibly interesting business kind of way by solving an organizational problem. And then with the music, are we paying two euros to that artist and two euros to that artist to listen to their music? No, Spotify took care of that. We pay a monthly subscription. Getting organized just get easier for payment for music. And one more Swedish example, used bookstores in Sweden have all arranged to digitalize what they have in their used bookstores at Bokbushen, which is like an Amazon for used books. So old used bookshops in Sweden are leading the digital revolution there. Who would have thought? But if you go on to that website in Sweden and look for an old book that was out in the 1970s, you're likely to find it at some independent dealer somewhere in Sweden. And then the next day, you'll have it wrapped up in some paper, newspaper paper and taped on with your name written on it, sent to you, and you pay through the website. Brilliant. Getting organized just got a lot easier just compared to browsing through all those bookstores, right? So this is the power of that. That's what Facebook does so incredibly well, making us stuck there, providing the connective tissue among people. Getting organized just get easier. So that means if there's one place where we go to be connected, that also means that there's a sixth way to own the world that's kind of connected to that. It's to be the place where we talk, where all the communication will happen, right? To provide the space for both personal conversations and public debate. If you set the rules for that, you control a democracy. Everybody knows that. So there's no different. Now, Edward Snowden taught us that if there's one place where all these, all these discussions go on, you're going to get surveillance. Companies and governments spying, looking down on us. But one more thing happens. We also get what some researchers are calling surveillance. So the French word sous for under. So, not big government looking down at us, not big brother looking down at us, but 10 million annoying little brothers looking up. <laughs> you, you follow their thought there? Society is changing more because we are monitoring each other rather than big government looking down at each single individual looking what they're doing. That's the theory behind the surveillance as a cultural game changer. And I think it's true. Um, just think of what social media does in our lives. Yeah, yeah, this struck me as I... Okay, so I live in Lund, a university town in the south of Sweden. And I live with my family and I don't live in a, in, a, in a house, a separate house. I live in an apartment building. And that's because I'd like to try to avoid nature at all costs. <laughs> People feel differently about that, but that's important to me. So. I want to stay out of the nature as much as I can. Still, I'm very well aware that this fall, this past month, has been an incredible month for wild mushrooms in Sweden. And you're allowed to walk out, you just pick them, collect them, and you can make great meals with the wild mushrooms that grow in our forests. Why do I know that? Because I can't open my goddamn Instagram without seeing another pile of wild mushrooms that some Swedish person that likes to be outside all the time has been putting on his rubber boots and walking out and picking a whole pile of yellow wild mushrooms and getting 100 likes on Instagram because that's so wholesome and so nice. And all of a sudden, we're defining in a way what's socially accepted to do. I have no friends putting out two lines of cocaine saying, oh, this is going to be a nice party tonight. <laughs> Which is fine, I don't need those friends, but I'm just saying that we're kind of narrowing the space of what's allowed and, and, and frowned upon in society by making ourselves so incredibly transparent. The backside? Well, these spaces disappear. The spaces to be sad, failed, hungover, lonely, and ill. The places where we're not perfectly happy, successful people at all times. There's a risk that we're creating a harder society where we ask unreasonable amounts of each other, an un unreasonable level of each other. We're not being true to what it's like to be a human being. You know, what if in the future, a future um, prime minister at some point says, I want to appoint you my new minister of justice, but then I found this illegal graffiti that you made 30 years ago in your social feed, so I can't do that because I can't have a minister of justice that broke the law in 1999. Too bad. I'm going to go with you instead. You were 14 years old. You didn't have a chance to screw up yet. <laughs> That's not a better society, but you know, we're, we're kind of there. We're kind of there. When we, when we look at our new politicians with, with a level of, 
of moralistic evaluation that none of us would stand up for in, in that kind. None of us would be able to pass that kind of, of what we demand of our public officials today. It's completely unreasonable. And we're making it harder by making all of our digital history perfectly searchable. We just as well could have put a microphone on everybody, on every party that they go to, have it transcribed and be able to just free text search in what they said. That's what we're doing. And the interesting thing now that this cultural change is not so much a question right now about a cultural choice, it's about question, technical design rather. Because, you know, internet is the society and society is the internet. It's the same thing. We have to build this in a way that this works together. And here's one website where we expose ourselves so incredibly. We just tell everything about ourselves, both publicly and in a layer of chats. We're making ourselves really vulnerable. And I'm asking again in the words of Edward Snowden, if somebody wants to know a whole lot about us, where do you think they'll be looking? Okay, I just need two more minutes of your time for my seventh way to own the world. My most important one, particularly important for a crowd like this. The seventh way to own the world is to screw net neutrality over. And my homework assignment to you is to read up just on the Wikipedia page, if you will, on net neutrality, just so you have it really, really up to speed on what this is and how this affects you in your, in your various countries, because it's very different in different countries. Just the basic principle that if you own a broadband network, you have to allow everybody to use it for their services. Simple as that. You're not allowed to call Netflix and tell Netflix, if you guys just pay a little more, we'll make your traffic a priority. Because if you do, there's going to be no startups competing with the big giants of Silicon Valley ever again. Because they can just buy up all the bandwidth. And there's just no way that an interesting startup in Bangalore or Barcelona or Lund, Sweden will have a chance to even reach an audience. The net neutrality laws make a guarantee that it's an equal net for everybody to use. There's been campaigns that are challenging this. I'm not going to be bothering going through that because I also just want to make a political point before we end this. For business, it's obvious for all of you that net neutrality is healthy for startups. But think about it in political terms. In a world without net neutrality, and the United States is about to vote it out, think two years from now, new presidential election. Five of Donald Trump's wealthiest friends walk into the biggest broadband carriers in the United States, the AT&T, the Verizon, the Comcast, and say, here's a pile of money, you guys. How about you always make sure to prioritize the traffic to Fox News? And how about you also making it really, really slow to CNN and New York Times? What a terrible terrible world that would be. Historically, you've needed military force to be able to do something like that, to control information like that. In a world without net neutrality, all you need is a pile of cash. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we are writing a digital constitution. We better get it right. Net neutrality is a necessary part, a pillar for the foundation that we want to set for the next generations to come, for business and for politics. So here they are, my seven ways to own the world. It's just a start. I hope this will spark some new conversations and most of all, some new questions for you. Always remember that you need to look to where the power is to also be able to hold the power players accountable. Because at the end of the day, if there's power and accountability, there's gotta be somebody who asks the question. And who's gonna be doing that again? That's us. Thanks. Thank you, Andreas. That's a lot to think about. It's a little bit heavy, and there's a lot of responsibility to have in this room. Now, before you all go, I believe you are off to the IT Expo reception, an evening celebrating Europe. We have some very special guests outside to show you the way. Make sure you go. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day, and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much.